Sure. Um, it's it's uh, something that, you know, we've been developing and creating a visual uh, image as humans for centuries. We've been slowly developing towards, you know, photorealism and, and then also something more illustrative and imaginative. Um, but in all cases, we've been using uh, depth cues to tell us where things belong or how they're relative to each other. And in their most, they're, they're, they're much more extensive than the basic ones, but basically, I can tell where you guys are because of the size of your size of your heads. That's perspective and the chairs and the lines in the room. Um, and then uh, the way the lighting is working, there's an array of lights in the room that are changing across your faces that tell me how you're relative to each other. So if you're on set and there's a row of you and there's a light beside you, you're all going to be lit differently, and it's going to triangulate and tell me how how you what your distance is to me, even with a very long lens. Now I've now lost your size relationship. The lighting still tells me, and overlap tells me, where you belong in space. So directors will um, sometimes go the opposite way too. They'll purposely take away your sense of depth in a space to push characters together, or to create more intimacy, or to flatten it into a 2D design. And we'll also support that in 3D. We'll make it very clear, like this is the director's intention a feeling of flatness here and distance. And so um, these are all tools that artists have used for, for centuries um, and, and, and are now just coming to their you know, fruition in, 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 in filmmaking. So uh, you know, Citizen Kane, for example, has incredible perspective cues. And everything's in focus in, in Citizen Kane. There's no depth of field to tell you how far away things are. And the lighting is also, is also pretty um, dramatic as well, which also tells you where things belong in space. It's not, like here you have 80 lights in the room, so it's not really clear how you relative to each other based on one light. There's all pockets of light. If there's one strong light over here, it would tell me what your overall relationship was to that light. And, and you know, Citizen Kane had that. Uh, Jurassic Park has a strong use of color, so you know, a warm foreground and a cool background or vice versa, so you're able to, to sense depth based on that. Um, and then he also um, very seldom has the camera uh, straight on to something. It's always at angle to something. So you have that perspective, two point, three point perspective. Um, and also he'll move the camera. So motion parallax is another depth cue. So when you're driving along the highway and you look out your car window, things closer, moving faster, slower, slower, slower. And, um, you know, or like the helicopters flying by in um, Apocalypse Now, right? You know how far away they are by, by their size and speed relative to your, to your view, even though it was a long lens. And um, so, so, you know, Stephen made a lot of use. It's only 1,200 shots in the film. So by having the camera move from one moment to another moment, you get a real sense of the space rather than having a locked off camera. So he's using you know, now motion cues that are available to you in cinematography to tell you where things belong in space and set you up. You know, there's a lot of foreground and background events. Like, this thing in the background is about to happen to these three people in the foreground, or vice versa. You know, the hunter with the velociraptor behind them, the shadow of the velociraptor in the kitchen. It's all foreground, background. It's all, the story's told in depth. It just happens to be on a 2D screen. And then stereo is a multiplier. So stereo times all of that great cinematography uh, just makes it work in, in 3D. Great, 3D is actually well, uh, offering a lot of filmmakers the, the, the advantage of getting their film remastered for 3D. Um, and obviously, you know, Titanic was remastered and Jurassic Park was remastered. It's a totally, totally different film. I, I was, and I have, I have the old uh, Blu-ray of Jurassic Park and then I just for the first time watched Jurassic Park 3D Blu-ray at my house uh, a couple days ago. I finally bought a 3D TV, I know that sounds funny for me, but I work all the time. And uh, I was amazed how rich the color were, how detailed it was. The remastering is, is, is wonderful. Um, relative to 4D, um, anything else that creates an immersive or an exciting environment for, 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 for audiences is, is great, you know? Sometimes it can be a distraction, it just, it really just depends on what you want to see, you know? Sometimes you don't want to see a 3D movie, sometimes you don't want your seat shaking. Um, but when you do, you want an immersive experience. I think it's uh, quite impressive. The first time I experienced 4D uh, was uh, uh, our company is owned by Deluxe. And um, 
and I'm required to go and sit and look at the films once the DCP package is made to go out to all the theaters just to quality check it. And I sat in a 4D chair for the first time in Avengers, and and uh, you know they hadn't quite programmed everything, so it was a bit weird to be like vibrating when like nothing was happening, you know. So that was a bit weird. But once they had it working, it was it was really impressive how locked in the audio, the 3D, and everything everything was. It was it was it was a definitely a cool experience.